Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar for Offenders for School Digital. Um, today we're going to be talking to some masters of business or maybe mistresses depending on how you want to call it and um, who are going to tell us about their career story and then we're going to invite the audience um, which is comprised of mainly students from Riverside Primary School to tell their uh, to ask questions um, about your careers. So like I said, I want to say a special welcome to all the pupils from Riverside Primary School in Scotland um, for joining us. And we have Mrs. Spencer here with us on the webinar. Um, so my name is Alison Ray McCune. I am an engagement manager with Founders for School. And our job is to help connect young people. So we connect business people to young people so that young people can open their eyes to the wonderful world of work that is out there and the many, many opportunities that are available to them. And by getting these insights and clear guidance, then it will hopefully inspire them to make more informed decisions about their future. And I know because it's a primary school, a lot of you will be going up to high school soon. So it's interesting for you to kind of know maybe what subject choices that you choose, what sort of careers that could lead to. So to the audience, um, your audio, video and chat function has been disabled for safeguarding um, purposes. Um, but you can ask questions and you can type in the questions whenever throughout the um, conversation. We are recording the session and it will be featured on our YouTube channel in due course. So sit back and enjoy the webinar and make as many notes as you like. So, Today with us, our business leaders are Becky Sage, CEO of ISI, Interactive Scientific Limited, and Nadia Whitmore, the regional funder, fundraiser for West of Scotland at Abelour Scotland's Children's Charity. Becky and Nadia, first of all, let me thank you for giving us your time today and for agreeing to share your story. So, just a little explanation about the, what we're expecting from you. So this type of talk, it's a career talk, and it basically, we would like to find out a little bit about how you get started um, okay. at university, if you went to college, if you did an apprenticeship, however you're, um, if you could both um, speak for about 10 minutes, and from that hopefully we'll spark some questions from the audience, mm -hmm. and then after that we'll go into the question and answer session. And if we start with Nadia, please. Yes, thanks very much for inviting me on today. I left school um, quite a while ago now. I didn't really have a plan as such. Um, I knew that I wanted to um, go to work. I had uh, done my hires at school. I had been quite good at English and modern studies. Um, but when leaving school, I think I just kind of wanted to, to work to earn money. Um, and at that time, I... Um, applied to do a, what was called a modern apprenticeship with Glasgow City Council. Um, so that was that was really great. Uh, that modern apprenticeship got me a job within the finance department of uh, Glasgow City Council's building services. Um, it was a great job um, and I was earning um, really quite good money for, for my age at the time. Um, but I think in my head I always kind of felt like I wanted to do something, do a job that really made a difference. Um, so I stayed at that job for about four or five years um, and then decided that I thought that I would like to go back to university to study again. Um, at that point, I um, applied to do an access course, um, to do so the access to sociology course I was really interested in. Um, I would be a good place to start to do the access course, the, the social work course oh, um, here. Um, to give you a wee bit of insight, mm -hmm. the director would be like, obviously, when you're fully qualified. Um, so I had some really interesting volunteer placements within that time. Um, I volunteered at Berlini Prison, uh, where I ran the toy box crash, uh, which was a crash for the um, children of prisoners. Um, and I also worked within a homeless centre. Um, in Glasgow, so that that was um, homeless accommodation for people um, from the ages of 16 to 25. So again, um, that gave me some really interesting insights into the kind of work that I'd be doing when I was qualified. Um, I think uh, what it also gave me insights into was how just how kind of emotionally difficult this kind of job um, might be. 
Um, and so I completed my social work course, but then didn't really, at that point, didn't think that I wanted to go into social work, work with children and families, which had always been um, the, the idea from the start. Um, so I left uni and I didn't, again, um, I, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, but I did know that I wanted a job um, that involved supporting people in society who maybe hadn't had the best start. Um, and I, I kind of knew then that that's been my real passion. Uh, at that point, I um, applied through um, a temporary agency just to get some temp work to kind of tide me over for a while. Um, and the first job that I got in my temporary um, post was at NSPCC Scotland. So NSPCC Scotland is um, a, a large another large Scottish children's charity, um, but they're actually kind of UK wide. So they've got branches right across the UK. Uh, I started there on a contract that should have lasted for six weeks. And seven years later, I left NSPCC as um, a community fundraising manager. Um, so I suppose the training for the kind of job that I'm in now um, was all learned on the job. Um, it didn't have anything to do with the degree. Well, it didn't have a lot to do with the degree that I had. It was good having a social work degree behind me because I could really understand the kind of issues that we were dealing with, but obviously my role with an NSPCC was, was a fundraising role. And I just had a really great supportive team who kind of taught me everything that I that I now know um, about fundraising. Um, so I, I think that's kind of my journey. Um, I have been now at Aberlour for just over two years. So Aberlour is another children's charity um, I have two kids of my own, so children's charities and, and working with children are, 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 is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I really enjoy my job at Aberlour. Um, I meet new people every day. It's so varied. So I meet new people every day. So one day I could be, you know, at a church giving a talk. Um, the following evening I might be at a black tie event, uh, you know, giving a talk. And basically the point of my job is to engage with community groups, with different corporate organisations, um, and to encourage them to support Aberlour by raising funds. And what I'm trying to do is kind of get them to see our vision. Um, so basically our vision at Aberlour is that we believe that every child and young person deserves a chance to flourish. And we believe that having a bad start in life doesn't have to determine the rest of your life. And we've got teams all across Scotland who are offering support services to help people's lives, to help break bad cycles and to help them get their lives back on track. And my job in all of that is that we are raising the money, uh, our fundraising team are raising the money to allow that to happen. Um, so while um, some of our services across Glasgow run community groups, they run youth programmes and things like that. And all of these things cost lots of money to run. Um, and so we're out and we're raising the money so that we can um, make that positive difference, positive change in um, young people's lives and, and, and their families. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, the skill set for this kind of job um, is you, you know you need to have kind of good communication skills um, I think you need to be able to um, build good rapport with people and one also really important thing for me and, and my job is resilience you, you must be very resilient in this kind of job because for every one person who I can encourage to support Aberlour believe me another five people have probably said no sorry <laughs> not today um and you know these kind of things you can't take personally you just have to move on a lot of times these people will come back at some point and that these are all things that i've learned throughout my career and um, you know because i suppose way back when i started somebody would say well no we're not interested in supporting you and your charity i did just to take it quite personally it's like well why not it's a great cause is it something that i've done and and actually you learn over time that it might just not be the right time uh, that that organization might be supporting somebody else at that point you know so these are all things that, that you learn as you go um and i have certainly learned a lot um during my career and you know i've been in fundraising now for over 10 years and i can tell you that i have not even probably touched the tip of the iceberg of what I know. I learn new things every single day. And actually, that's one of the things about my job that I, I really love. Um, you never know what the next day is going to be like. 
Um, so it, that keeps me going. And I think for me, what I can say is, is while it's a very challenging job, it's also a very rewarding job. Um, and ultimately, I think for me, I feel now um, as if this, I'm in the job that I'm meant to be in, that, that I should be in. I'm able to support people, uh, maybe from a kind of a step removed from that first line of our service teams and things, but that really, um, that really works for me. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a great job. I really enjoy it. Um, and I hope to be in fundraising for many more years to come. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have actually had one question come in that yes. I think would be good to answer right now. And is how do you actually raise the money? So um, we raise money several different uh, in several different ways um, lots of our money comes from big kind of challenge events so um, this Sunday for example the Glasgow Kilt Walk should have been taking place so our job as fundraisers is to recruit people to come on and, and basically support Aberlour by taking part in big kind of charity events like that uh, we also encourage people to give regularly so for for talking to you know sign up to a direct debit to give us say five pounds per month um we have events like lunches and um balls so like the big kind of charity balls that you see we do we hold things like that um we engage with different kind of church groups and things who uh, we've got a great um support through um the episcopal church in scotland so uh, we have lots of supporters who give to us through their churches and things like that so there are various different ways and and i suppose is one another thing that about your job is is, is fundraisers is that we need to be kind of uh, coming up with new ideas for new um kind of unique fundraising things that nobody else is doing um so that we have that kind of unique selling point i suppose um to engage people and, and get people on board. And do you actively take part in those fundraisers then? I do, uh -huh. and I, ha I, I will say that um, I am very much of the kind of opinion that I wouldn't ask anybody to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. So that means that I have taken part in things like absolute <laughs> support <laughs> off the fourth road rail bridge to try and encourage other people to do it. Uh, while I say that, um, I've also done the kilt walk, but only the six mile walk. I don't yeah. think I'm quite ready for 26 mile yet, <laughs> but maybe one day. <laughs> there you go. That's your challenge for you. Yep. No, thank you for that, um, Nadia. That was really interesting. And definitely a lot of the things you were talking about there, like the emotional resilience and the communications, I know that's something schools are really trying to focus on to try and work on future well being, but they are so, so relevant. That's great. So now we've heard from Nadia, I'd like to turn the table on to Becky now to find out about her career because it's very different from um, the route that Nadia's taken. So when yeah. you come, Becky. Thanks, Alison. And thanks, Nadia. That was really interesting to hear your story. I think a different route, but there's still a lot of things in common. So <laughs> it's, it's interesting to hear. Um, so yeah, I'm Dr. Becky Sage, and um, I actually have more than one job right now. My, my main job is CEO of Interactive Scientific. Um, that's a small startup company. I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. I also teach uh, entrepreneurship at a university, and I coach other business leaders uh, so that I can help them grow their businesses. And I'm a gymnastics coach and a gymnast, so um, I definitely have lots of different balls in the air. Uh, the best way to describe my career is as an entrepreneur. So an entrepreneur is somebody who finds ways to solve problems out there in the world uh, by building teams, products and finding ways that you can reach different customers. Uh, the problem that we've been focused on with my team at Interactive Scientific is to do with making science easier to understand. So many things in science are invisible. Atoms, molecules, viruses, um, the, the medicines we use to cure those, those viruses, energy, DNA, all these important things. Uh, you know, they really impact our lives, but they're invisible. So we use virtual reality and we combine that with scientific data to try and make the invisible scientific world visible. This job, didn't exist before I created it. Um, and it definitely didn't exist when I was born. Um, so 
how did I get here? What, what was my journey to that? Because I couldn't look into the future and say, oh, that's what I want to do. Um, so when I was young, I thought you grew up, you got a job, somehow along the way you got good at that job you made some money and then you retired in the future and uh it didn't really sound that fun to me <laughs> and i didn't really want to grow up um at that time and actually that's not really the reality um as we've already heard from nadia and i think many you know most people now have, have many different jobs uh the only jobs i really knew about were teaching because both my parents were teachers i went to school all the adults around me were teachers and uh, whilst I, I think what teachers do is amazing, I didn't really want to be a teacher because I wanted to explore other things that were out there. There was something inside of me that thought, actually, this isn't probably the right path for me. So I had to do so much learning along the way. Now, I think there are four things that you need to really help you throughout your career. Um, knowledge, skills, confidence, and contacts. Um, it can be quite useful in many jobs to have certain qualifications as well. And the easiest way to get all of these things is to really work on things that you care about. So that's kind of the, the bonus, but probably the most important thing. Um, but I, again, when I was young, I was completely clueless that I needed all these things. I just thought I had to be really good at something at school and, and then I could just use that. So I was good at science in school. And so I went to university after I finished school for eight years. I did four years uh, doing a degree in chemical physics, and then another four years doing a PhD, which is why I'm Dr. Becky Sage, um, in chemistry. And that, that helped me um, to develop lots of knowledge in science and, and some skills, and it helped me to get those qualifications, which have been important for me. Um, but I, what I knew at the end of that was that I didn't want to stay in scientific research. So, so the skills and the knowledge that I got weren't actually that helpful for me for the next stage of my career. And just like Nadia, actually, the first thing I did was go and get a temp job <laughs> after I finished my PhD, so, which proved to be very helpful. Um, so it had been really important to me that whilst doing my PhD and, and my degree, I'd actually done other jobs as well. So that had helped me to develop loads of other skills, which I didn't really realise at the time. Um, but when I look back, those were really important things. So I'd done gymnastics coaching. I'd volunteered as a buddy for a charity called the Terence Higgins Trust. I'd worked in science communication. I'd worked in events. So by the time I did finish my PhD, I kind of had all of these, these valuable skills, knowledge, contacts, um, but I just didn't really know what to do with them. And the thing that was definitely missing for me at that point was confidence. Um, my confidence was actually really, really low uh, when I finished my PhD. And I think that was, I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't really know how I could add value through the work I was doing. And that was something that was really important to me. So. That's kind of why the, the only thing I could do was go, OK, well, I need to get a job. So I went to this temp agency and um, and I got a job there, which was my first introdu introduction to the world of entrepreneurship and business. Um, and I still had so much to learn at that point. So I worked for um, starting with this temp job, I worked for government organisations who were funding science and technology businesses. And through that, I started to meet people I respected. I started to figure out the things I enjoyed. Like I, I enjoyed innovated, uh, innovating, I enjoyed business, I enjoyed communicating with people, um, you know, doing presentations. And um, along that time, I also always did more than one job. So <laughs> that really helped me to continue to learn, to continue to develop my skills. And really importantly, gave me a unique perspective on things. It meant that what I could bring could, could then be even more valuable in the workplace. So eventually, after doing a number of different things, I found a group of people who were as excited as I was about using technology and communication tools to make science easier to understand. And so that's when I started leading and building the interactive scientific team. Uh, one of my big jobs uh, and still one of my big jobs is to to raise money uh, so that we can pay people and 
pay pay ourselves, um, pay myself. Uh, I also have in in the past, not so much now, done lots of software design. Um, then working with customers uh, who, in our case, are um, schools and and scientific research. And through all that time, I actually found that I was developing all these skills in entrepreneurship and getting really, really feeling like I was adding value, which is why I've now have begun to do entrepreneurship coaching and entrepreneurship teaching as well. So that that's uh, things that I've learned through doing this job. Uh, raising money is mostly about being able to communicate ideas, uh, things that don't necessarily exist yet, helping people to be excited about those ideas and and giving them the trust that, that they need that you are going to deliver on those ideas. Um, now, one of the big things in any, in, well, in, in any business, and I think in any life as we're experiencing now with shutdown, um, uh, is that unexpected things happen. And that happens a lot in a startup company. There's, there's no, no two days the same. And yeah, you're dealing with change all the time. And sometimes good unexpected things and sometimes bad unexpected things. Um, so you really have to be able to deal with with change and I, i've also written down here how to be resilient resilience is a really important skill um how to get through the hard times not take everything too personally and um and also how to help other people through that journey how to help other people be the best that they can be especially when when you're when you're leading a team that's such an important part of your job is really helping them to be confident and to deliver to their best um, and I think the most important lesson I've learned along the way is that my work is an opportunity for me to help other people as well as to look after myself um, and so you spend a lot of time and energy on the work that you do so it is so so important that you do work that you think is valuable and you think is important to you and I've just written down a few a few top tips. These are, these are my top tips. So um, don't worry if you don't know what you want to be. Um, your job might not even exist yet, just like mine. You might even create it for yourself. Uh, the people that you meet along the way will be are so important that they are the ones that will help you throughout your career. And it's so important for you to treat people with kindness and respect. Um, that will come back to you. Uh, don't worry if you if you feel like I can't get my dream job, I can't get it right away. You almost definitely won't get it right away. You probably won't even know what it is um, until it until you're there. Um, but have fun along the way. Try lots of different things. And that's OK. Um, qualifications can be helpful, as I said. My PhD has definitely been helpful for me along the way. Um, but on their own, they won't give you all the skills, conf confidence, contacts that you need. So be ready to just keep learning every day. I know Nadia said this as well. It's so important to, to be the type of person who just wants to continue to soak up learning. And that includes working on your own self, your own self-confidence um, and, and figuring out what's important to you. That leads me to my next one. Look after yourself. Uh, sometimes work can be can be negative and sometimes you might find yourself in negative situations in the workplace and it is really important that you look after yourself through that and in some cases there might be situations that you do need to walk away from and that again that's that's okay um, but that doesn't mean quit just because your job is hard work um, which leads me to my next point which is enjoy the hard work and enjoy the journey because you think I think sometimes in our career we think we're like aiming for a certain place in the future um but actually it's it's the whole you know it's very uh, cliche thing to say but it is the journey that matters and um my final point is ask for help I, this is something that it took me a long time to learn i thought i had to do everything by myself and prove everything by myself and actually the workplace is all about how you work with other people and and people will want to help you uh, when i've worked with coaches and mentors and for you that might be teachers friends um other other people parents um it, it really completely changed my lifestyle asking for help because that's when people started to show me that this is my journey it's nobody else's journey and just like your journey will be your career journey so thanks for listening and i'm excited to hear any questions okay well fantastic and i really like the common themes that ran between mm. you 
no coordination there beforehand. So that just <laughs> is very true. Okay, so I've got two questions that actually can be rolled into one big one. Mm -hmm. How do you prioritize and make time for it all? And which of your jobs do you like best? <laughs> um, very good question. Um, so I'm the, yeah, it depend, depends on the day <laughs> to some extent. But I've definitely made a choice that I want to spend more time working with um, with other entrepreneurs and with other people. So, so doing coaching and doing teaching is where I'm kind of progressing onto in in my career. Um, so that's not to say that I I don't enjoy doing what what I do. Um, some of those other things I do, but actually, yeah, help helping other people and being able to give back and use my skills and experience is is the part at the moment that I enjoy. Um, gymnastics coaching is also very fun, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't think I'd like to do that all the time. Um, but yeah, co coaching. How many jobs is that in total? You have? Oh gosh, I I'm really worried about having having to do my um, finances at the end of this year because it's <laughs> going to be all over the place. But um, it's so it's growing at the moment so I, I have two companies that i'm a director of um and then and so a lot of the jobs kind of fall under those two brackets but then i've got two others um so and how do i prioritize is such an important question um so i'm at a point with our company where i don't i'm not needed for all of the day-to-day -day things and the the things that are going on on the ground so so there are different ways to prioritize and i think one is about um if, if something really needs to be done then finding a really good team around you and being able to de delegate to that team uh is important um but the other part i think is all about um listening to yourself and saying like if this isn't really really important then then does it need it does it need to be done and it's starting to say no to things is um is such an important skill to learn and and again it's not always just about like i don't want to do that thing so i'm going to say no to it um but it's about and actually for me it's all about what is the longer term vision so i in fact create um kind of vision board boards or goal lists and and i look to where i'm going and if things don't align with that that vision and those goals of where we're going then you have to kind of it, there has to be a very good reason to do those things okay good okay and this one for nadia um which part of your job do you like best um i think for me the part of my job that i like best is meeting different people every day um so on a daily basis i could be meeting with a corporate and then meeting with a volunteer um, I'm meeting with different people from different walks of life all the time and speaking to them about their experiences and their understanding of our charity. Um, and I just find that I'm, I'm a, a people person. I like to talk. That was one thing in school that I used to get into trouble for quite a lot <laughs> was <laughs> chatting. But it certainly helped me in my career um, because I love to do that now. And that's how you build up a rapport with people and you build up a relationship. And I suppose with fundraising, um, again, um, you know, like what Becky was saying, um, you're asking people to give you money um, to deliver services. They need to have trust in you and building up rapport with people and good relationship with people is how you do that. Um, so that's that's definitely um, the, my most favourite part of the job. And then there are other things that I don't like doing so much, like the ab sales and things, but I do them anyway, because <laughs> that's all part of the job. <laughs> Okay, so you both touched on sometimes having to do things that you don't really enjoy. Kind of tied in with that, somebody's asked, how do you, um, how do you keep going when you're doing your work? What, what keeps you going? What makes you can get up every morning and go to work and continue doing the best job that you can? Yeah, um, so there's, I think there's kind of, a long-term answer and a short-term answer to that um okay. so and, and there's different types of challenges in work as well so so to um so when when there's things that make you feel a bit like oh my gosh that's that's a big deal i have to deal with that that's quite stressful or anxiety building mm -hmm. for me that's all about the longer term vision and saying again it's like okay is this is this thing that's making me feel worried important enough to get over and, and like get to that place 
of um you know of the reward of hitting some of those longer term goals and and once you've i mean in some ways doing some of those things um they get uh they get easier over time i think nadia referred to that as well like there's some things that earlier on you think oh my gosh this is such a big deal it's really hard i don't know how to do it how am i gonna you know i'm really afraid of doing this or something and and actually those things become easier over time and i'm motivated by well if i don't do this thing then i stand still and i don't get to hit some of those longer term goals for the more like day-to-day -day mundane type things um and, and just kind of keeping going on, on those things. I, I actually just use some really simple techniques like writing lists and um, I, I have a bit of a technique called zero based budget where you brainstorm everything you've got to do, you write that, you prioritize it, you write a list and, and you kind of cut it off at the number of hours that you've got to do it um, and then work through that during the week. <coughs> I also use, um, uh, what's called the pompadouro methodology so you set a timer for 25 minutes um and then you uh, have a five minute break and that's really important so you're not just sitting down and and getting you know if you spend too long in one task then your mind starts to not be as fresh and your body starts to you know not be as well so really good to to get up and have little micro breaks uh, that helps as well for me anyway to to keep me going through the day and and, and that gives me better long-term health as well. Okay, Nadia as well, what keeps you going? Oh, you're on mute, Nadia. Sorry, I think sometimes for me um, in fundraising, what happens is as we go out and we're doing the task every day of raising the money, um, and sometimes, like I'd said before, we're kind of a step removed from the frontline workers who are working with the families and children every day. Uh, and what happens is, as we go along in our own wee jobs, doing what we do, kind of siloed in the fundraising team. Um, and then, you know, we'll hear a story one day of how the money that we've raised has really helped and has really made a positive impact. And that, for me, is, is those kind of things that keep me going. Because you can get bogged down in your work. You can forget why you're doing what you're doing. And sometimes that does happen. Um, to us, um, you know, you're going along and you're, for, you know, you're just raising your money and you're not actually seeing the benefit of it at the time, but it is happening. Um, and then, you know, we'll get some emails from the service team just to say, you know, the money that you've raised has helped us to do this, has helped us to do that. And that really helps to keep us going. It helps to motivate us and push us on and um, keep us on track to raise all the money that we need to raise. Excellent. Okay. Um, for both of you, did you have a mentor that really helped set you on your career path? Yeah, should I go? Um, I, I didn't have, well, I look back and I think actually there were some good people around, but I, I didn't really um, start to have the benefit and have a kind of a proper mentor until about 10 years into my career. And I wish I'd had people sooner. I wish I'd been uh, more proactive about that. Um, I, but since then I've had many mentors and I think like different mentors for different things and, um, and as well as coaches. So yeah, having a mentor was, has been really important and that's what allowed me to, um, you know, make much better decisions. Okay, Nadia, what about yourself? Uh, I had many mentors, um, obviously, as I say, a lot of what I know about fundraising started for me learning on the job. Uh, so I've had some great mentors, but actually just as importantly, um, I've worked with people who've not been so great and what they've taught me is is how maybe I wouldn't want to be in the future or how I wouldn't want to treat somebody in the future, which for me is, has been equally important and, um, you know, in this journey as well, you know. That's such a good point, actually, because, yeah, I've, I had, um, yeah, don't do it just for the sake of getting a mentor, make sure it's the right person. You know, we, we had people, especially being in a startup, who were like, we want to be part of this exciting journey, and, and they'd come on board, and, yeah, they didn't really care. Um, they just wanted to be kind of part of something. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, understanding that is one of the things, and it's something you've both touched on, refers back to the confidence to understand that. So we have a question on how can a young person build their confidence? Mm -hmm. And we're running, we're getting close to almost being finished. Okay. So I'll get quite a few questions. Oh quite my gosh. Yeah. So um, <laughs> developing your skills will help you to develop your confidence and getting out there and doing things. But I think it's also really important that you um, 
kind of listen to the voices that you have inside your own head as well and and the and you that you know um inside your own head that you don't don't tell yourself oh i'm bad at that or i'm rubbish or i everyone's got to start somewhere so um try and tell yourself positive things like i can add value and i can um i i can learn and i can uh, you know i've got good people around me and, and that is another way of building confidence having good people around some, you. some of the some of the biggest kind of learning curves for me have come from actually making the biggest mistakes that i've ever made in my career mm -hmm. because of things that i won't do again and they've really built my confidence and because i did learn on the job i made lots of mistakes and i still do but you learn from every single one of them and that certainly has helped me build my confidence okay excellent okay so i've got a couple of questions that are all round about your experience at school. So how much do you value your school days now that you work in business? And do you think the school was incredibly important to where you are now? Or do you think you just went to school? I'm at school, oh, you, you know. So I was just going to say, um, I wish I'd valued my school days more when I had been at school, because I think sometimes it's not until you look back um, that now I'd wish that maybe I'd applied myself a bit more at school. Um, don't get me wrong, I've, I've still ended up where I want to be and I think that's really important as well that there are different paths and you don't always have to follow, you know, the kind of this is what society says, leave school, go to university, you can still find yourself where you want to be. Um, but certainly I think my schooling was, was so important and, and, and building me into the person that I am today, I just wish maybe I had listened a wee bit more when I was there. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to have almost the opposite, which was when I was in school, I thought that all that it was about was going to my lessons, like getting good grades um, and just doing that. And, and I wish that I'd realised that kind of everything else is important as well. And developing as a person was really important. I think I almost pressed pause on developing as a person and just like threw myself into into getting passing my exams um which like i said getting those qualifications can be um are, are generally a useful part along your path and you're developing skills along the way um and i wish that i'd have yeah st stepped back a little bit more and had a bit more perspective when i was at school and made the most of um of the wisdom of the people around me but also just friend the friendships and um developing as a person <laughs> Okay. And did you both think in high school that you were going to be as successful as you are? Was that always, did you think that was always going to be your future? No, definitely not. I don't think I had a clear plan for my future even after I left school. Um, there, there was still a, a big point at the start of my career where I thought, is this the right thing to do? Am I doing the right thing? And you know, there are still days, some days when you're having a bad day, you think, oh, I want to be doing this but you, you do all the things we discussed before they keep you going and things so I certainly um, for me I don't think I had a clear vision of where I want to be and I think that kids are still young at secondary school it's difficult to map out your whole life yeah. career mm -hmm. path you know in front of you um, when actually you change so much the person that I am now today at 35 is a completely different person to I was when I left school you know and my views and my opinions and things are all very different as well so mm. I think that's the big thing for me, like my idea of what success is has changed so much. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I was, you, I think you're just so inexperienced often when you're young and you don't have, you're, you're in a bit of a, your own little bubble. And you, like I said, for me, success was passing exams, but, and that's fine until you finish university. And then it turns out like passing exams isn't what you've got to do in, <laughs> in real life. So, um, so I, I definitely have changed what my idea of success is. Okay, so bearing that in mind, what advice would you give to your younger self if they're thinking about their careers and probably to be honest for primary school kids more just about what they, what subjects they might be thinking of choosing when they go into high school? I think for me it would be, you know, certainly for me at school would be to have listened more, probably applied myself a wee bit more. But also, I suppose, to kind of give yourself a break. I, I feel like sometimes, you know, kids, I've, I've got a 14-year-old daughter as well, and, um, you know, she's choosing her subjects now, she's beating herself up about what she wants to do when she leaves school and willies. And I think, you know, 
if a job's meant for you and you want to get there, then you you will get there. And it doesn't always, as I say, need to be, you know, you, you might choose a subject at school that might not necessarily help because you change your career path and you're older or whatever. And it's fine. There are ways around that. And, and I think not to worry about it too much, kind of enjoy your time at school, but mm. also apply yourself when you have to. Um, but I just give yourself a bit of a break about it, you know, don't worry too much about anything because there are ways to get there um, and you might not always succeed the first time, but if you try hard enough, you'll get there eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think attitude is more important than like specifically what subjects you choose. Um, I definitely say try and have a bit of a breadth in terms of some things that you find easy, some things that are maybe a bit more technical, you know, so as science and technology can, can be useful, but things that are more creative as well. And, and having, having that breadth can, it will really help you to develop and have a wider perspective when you go out into the world. Um, and, but yeah, it's more about how, like how you conduct yourself and how you take those lessons that you're learning and, and turn them into something. But again, I'd also, my, my tip to myself would have definitely been like, <laughs> stop beating yourself up. <laughs> I'm exactly the same as Nadia said. And also don't let other people beat, yourself, beat you up. You know, <laughs> it's, um, it, you, th things will be okay. But do, just, just apply it. Yeah, applying yourself, same thing. Okay, we've just had two sneaky questions come in. <laughs> and we've only got three minutes. So we're going to have to have really, really quick answers. But when you were both young, what was your dream job? I wanted to be a lawyer when I was younger at school. Okay. I wanted to be an actor and a an accountant <laughs> and a doctor. <laughs> um, Interesting combination there. <laughs> and if you do not have the job that you've already got at the moment, what job would you want to have? So still be a lawyer for me, I think. <laughs> mm, okay. Yeah, I would definitely be a performer. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think we'll end it on there. Thank you very much, both of you, and to Mrs. Spencer for bringing along her class. I <laughs> hope all the young people listening have got a little bit of insight to their all the many options, I think, that's open to them in the careers. And basically, don't worry. You've got a long time to be planning this and you can change your mind as often as you want and there will always be people who will be there to help you along the way so thank you very much um, we have another session coming up this afternoon if anybody wants to sign in for that where we're going to have two people who work for um, socially responsible technology companies taking part and we have quite a few going on well while we're in lockdown we'll be doing online webinars so if anybody ever wants to do it. So the only thing I have to do now is give a very, very big thank you to both Nadia and Becky for sharing their time and sharing some of their wisdom and their stories with us. It was very, very enjoyable. And I actually want both of your jobs right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was great. So thank you very much, everybody. It was a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.